Balska, Pastor Dillard and I are that group that only perform one time. <laughs> hey, Stace, it took work, huh, man? We're like, triple court. <laughs> uh, good to see you this morning. Amen. Glad you're here. Want to uh, appreciate Pastor Campbell for uh, inviting me to minister this morning. And on behalf of the Chandler congregation, uh, Connie, the staff, we're so appreciative of you making uh, the effort to be here, and we're going to believe God that this is going to be an incredible week. Amen. Glad you're here. If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, you turn with me to Luke chapter 14. And uh, there was an NBA player. His name was Lynn Bias. Excuse me. His name was Lynn Bias. And uh, if they could put the picture up, he was an incredible talent. Uh, some say he would have been Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan. He played in college against Michael Jordan. That picture is him and Michael Jordan. But he came out of college two years after Michael Jordan. And when people spoke of him and Michael Jordan and their competition, they said it would have been like LeBron James and Michael Jordan. No. Lynn Bias was 6'8". They say he could jump higher than Michael Jordan. He had a jump shot that they said was absolutely pure. Right? And so in 1986, Lynn Bias got drafted by the Boston Celtics. He got drafted number two overall. And of course, this was the culmination of much of the preparation of his life. This was what he had dreamed of. This is what he had given himself to. And no doubt at that point, this is a highlight. And so he gets drafted. And two days after being drafted, Lynn Bias um, went back to college in Maryland with, where he went to college. And he got with a couple of his university buddies. And they decided to celebrate him getting drafted. They partied all night, drugs, alcohol. That next morning when Lynn Bias's friends went to go wake him up, Lynn Bias didn't wake up. You know the story, he overdosed from cocaine. Yeah. When I read that, I said, here's a man who lived his life, aimed his life, and he was incredibly blessed. But in that blessing, somewhere, that blessing, the very thing he had dreamed of, that blessing turned into a curse. I want to minister this morning when the blessing becomes a curse. Bit of part two of probably what Pastor Grabowski was saying. Luke chapter 14, verse 16, we'll start there. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant to, at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord begin to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you have commanded. Still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be filled. For I say to you, verse 24, that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. God, we come this morning by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, God, for all that you are and all you're doing in the midst of this assembly and this midst of our fellowship. I pray, God, you'd speak to hearts, challenge men and women for the great call we give you glory this morning in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's consider firstly, we are a blessed people. Our text this morning opens up and Jesus is telling a parable. In this parable, he speaks of a man who is having a huge dinner celebration. Most uh, scholars believe that this man would have been a king uh, or some sort of dignitary uh, because uh, they would have been known for having these massive uh, dinner banquets. And so the idea is here's this king. He sends out invitations to a feast. Now, Jesus is telling this parable in this story. Uh, but what the parable is referring to, of course, is the great 
banquet with the Messiah. This is spoken of many times in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, it is the, referred to as the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19.9. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So let's consider, firstly, life before God. How many remember how life was before Jesus? Drugs, addictions, alcohol, bad credit. Hello, somebody. I was one of those men before I got saved that Pastor Rosario was speaking of last night. I would not have been able to help purchase the Colleen building. <laughs> I think I had a 510 credit score. And I think they give you that for having a valid social security number. <laughs> and so no one would loan me money. I had no reliable transportation. I remember I would go to people's house uh, and, you know, their driveway would be available, but I'd always park on the street because uh, I had a tendency to leave a little something behind. They say, no, bro, you can park in the driveway. I said, no, you don't want me to park in your driveway because the oil spot won't be removed. <laughs> Life before God, loneliness, hopelessness, no real peace, turmoil, drama, chaos, that is life before God, but then there's life after God. I mean, oh, if you're here and you're saved this morning, we're walking in the blessing of Abraham. This is the life we now live today. I want to show you a picture, if you will. This is my grandmother's house. Stacey and I were just there back in the Midwest a couple, few weeks ago at Chandler Leadership, and we stopped by my grandmother's house, and uh, my grandmother's lived there over 50 years, and across the street I grew up, and I couldn't find a picture of our old house, but I grew up in this house uh, for a lot of time. Show the next picture. The house next to it is abandoned. It says no trespassing. You can see it's boarded up, and uh, uh, about every other house on the block looks like this. Show the next picture. That's right across the street. That's the next house. If you can zoom in on that for me, Paul. And so this is where we were. This is where I grew up. If you look up anything, I just read an article the other day that called St. Louis the murder capital of America. I was, uh, Stacey and I were there. We're there with my cousins, my aunt, and it's about 7 o'clock, and they all start packing up, getting ready to leave. And we're like, where are you going? They're like, it's getting dark. We're going home. And so Stacey and I just kind of talk. I'm like, Stacey, get your stuff. Because if the people that live here are going home before dark, we're out of here. Now, I want you to think of this. The fact that I came from that to hear preaching at a Chandler Bible conference is absolutely astounding. It's incredible. You know, when I got saved, I didn't own a, tra uh, own a passport. I had committed a felony, and I was told that I was never going to be able to leave the United States. I remember there was a brother in the church. He said, Tori, why don't you just apply? You, you, who knows? And, and so I applied. It was only a couple hundred dollars. And, and so I had forgotten about it. Life had gone on. I never considered it. You know, you, you put it in the back of your mind, man, I'll never be able to be a missionary or go anywhere. And so what was interesting is one day I go to the mailbox, and we're living right down there in Gilbert, and I, I go to the mailbox, and there's an envelope there. And the envelope, it's one of those big manila, you know, yellow envelopes, and it says, U.S. government. Now, when you're newly saved, you start thinking, like, is my past catching up with me? I didn't even want to open it. I was nervous, I remember. But I opened it up, and inside that envelope was a United States passport. I remember running around my neighborhood shouting the victory. I'm like, I can go, I can go. But again, think of that. Here I went from a man who had never left America, barely even left the city of St. Louis, uh, and now today I stand before you having preached in over 20 nations uh, around the world. That is what God can do. But that's not just true of me. I mean, no, that is true of each and every one of us here this morning, no, because that is what you and I are a part of. And so if you've served God for any, uh, you know, real amount of time, no doubt you have your own rags to riches story uh, as it relates to getting saved and being brought into the kingdom of God. And if you don't have that materially, you definitely have it spiritually. Uh, there are pastors here this morning. Today, you have a nice building. You have disciples that follow you and trust you. 
You have money in the bank. Your ministry, you have influence. You're reaching people around the world. And if you'd be honest here this morning, you are incredibly blessed. Because that is what the kingdom of God in our fellowship offers each and every one of us. So much opportunity. In Luke chapter 5, we see a very vivid picture of life before Christ and then life after Christ. Verse 3, he says he got into the boat, speaking of Jesus, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little bit from the land. He sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and the net was breaking. Think about this. Disciples... Without Jesus in the boat, fishless. With Jesus in the boat, fish full. I don't know if there could be a clearer picture of life before Christ and life after Christ. Listen, just the mere presence of Jesus in our lives makes us incredibly blessed and fruitful. These guys went from local fishermen to global preachers from life with no real purpose to kingdom ministry. And again, if you live long enough and serve God long enough, this is, this is our portion. There's a man by the name of Robert Woodbury. Robert Woodbury is a sociologist or he was in the early two thousands. Woodbury was a graduate student at the university of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he's in one of these required lectures, and he's listening to his professor, and his professor starts talking about this link that he's noticed between democracy and Protestantism. And so, in other words, he's looking at these developed nations, uh, these prospering nations, uh, and he's saying there's, there's a religious connection here. Woodbury, as he's listening to this, he decides, you know what, I'm going to study this further. And so he began to uh, go through all the archives and the data in the library there at Chapel Hill. And he started looking up religion. He found an atlas from 1925. And he started looking up every missionary station in the world. And he's developed, I mean, he started gathering tons of data. He traveled to Thailand. He traveled uh, to India. He went all across Europe. And he's talking to churches historians. He's interviewing people uh, and he's charting these mission statements across the Congo. uh, uh, All these, he's collecting very rare, rare data. Um, He began to pull this data together. And in his own admission, he said, I did not set out to look for this. He said, but what I found was a very strong connection between missionary work and the health of nations. Uh, He said, I still wasn't convinced, and I was determined to be my own greatest critic. So he put together a team of research analysts, and uh, they spent years literally literally amassing data, conducting all this historical analysis, uh, and uh, they only further convinced Woodbury of his initial findings. He went on to say, and I quote, he said, the areas where Protestant missionaries had a significant presence in the past— are on average more economically developed today with comparatively better health, lower infant mortality, lower corruption, greater literacy, higher education attainment, especially for women. Uh, He said missionaries, listen to this, were not just part of the picture, they were central to it. Not only was the gospel a factor, it turned out that the gospel was the most important factor. Now, how many know this claim really shouldn't surprise us all that much as believers. John 10, 10, Jesus says, he says that he came to give us life more abundantly. And so this describes the effect of the gospel and what it has on societies. Woodbury actually called this the lift effect. You can look this up. He said this is the lift effect. And what he's saying is that anybody who would surrender to Jesus, whether an individual or a nation, and nations that would support missions, he says they're gonna, there's something about that economically and socially. It's like it's, it's a lift effect on your life. In other words, what he's saying is salvation doesn't just lift us out, it lifts us up. Went on to say, what is the solution to illiteracy? The gospel. What is the solution to poverty? The gospel. What is the solution to government corruption? 
the gospel. In other words, it's not politics, it's the gospel. Verse 16 of our text says that when they first received the invitation, how many know when they first received that invitation, they would have been incredibly excited? They've got this invitation from the king. Back in 2018, Prince Harry and Meghan Merkel's wedding, don't get too sad right now, they sent out 600 invitations. And the most surprised invitation was an 18-year-old girl. Her name is Daniela Tipperly, if they can put this picture up. Daniela typically was just a commoner. She was just a run-in-the-mill teenager who had done some volunteer uh, work at her school, and uh, she had done charity work. And so here she is. One day, da Daniela Tipperly goes to her mailbox. I think her mom actually went. And in her mailbox was an invitation to the royal wedding. She was blown away. She wasn't expecting this. So think about this. There's going to be celebrities there. There's going to be royalty from all around the world. There's British soldiers uh, who had served with Harry. I think he had 200 in them. Uh, and so sir, can you imagine, right, going to your mailbox, uh, and when you get there, there's an invitation from the palace, from the king. No doubt you would publicize this. Tell all your friends about the invite. Can you imagine today with social media? This would be your Instagram page for the rest of your life. <laughs> hey, did I ever tell you about that time? Yes, you told me. <laughs> Not just excited, but the thought is in our text. That is what is happening in our text. When these people received the invitation, they would have started making plans. They would have started making preparations. Their priorities would have begun to be a rearranged. Can you say amen? So they could accept. Can you imagine Danielle? When she got some, no doubt, she calling in the work. Sorry, boss. Uh, I, I know you got me scheduled. I ain't going to be able to make it. Well, what do you, uh, I, find somebody, no, we can't find, oh, I quit. <laughs> because I'm having dinner at the king's table. Remember when Jesus called the early disciples? The Bible says James and John, they're there, and they're, they're in the boat with their father fishing. And Jesus walks by, you know, we don't understand how it all went, but we get the picture that Jesus is like, okay, hey, follow me. And they're like, peace out, dad. Sorry, man. Hey, hey, hey. I'm out. Wait, where are you going? Where you going? What about the family business? Hey, bro, you're going to have to find some. I'm, I'm, I love you, dad, but. Matthew 4, And immediately they left the boat and their father. And followed him. All of this speaks to overwhelming gratitude that we first feel when we first got saved. God wants to dine with me? He sent his son for me? God is inviting me to join him? He actually wants to use me? I told the story before, but I remember... Pastor Ortiz asked Station I, I was our first ministry besides vacuuming the, the, the carpets and cleaning bathrooms, which is, hey, praise the Lord. One day he said, hey, do you think you and your wife can take the teens down to Tucson? There's a, there's a rally or something, youth rally. And I said, me? <laughs> now, I had had 10 tickets before I even turned 16, <laughs> driving tickets. <laughs> something like, hey, you want us? To drive the teenagers? <laughs> did you tell the parents? <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. But we were so grateful. It's like, man, I was like the militant soldier. You guys aren't going to talk on this trip. You're not going to chew no gum. We're going to Tucson and back. They're like, man. But we were so grateful. Why? Because that's what blessing does. Blessing produces gratitude. And that's how it is when we come into the kingdom. We go from nobody really inviting us anywhere, nobody special at least, to now the king is inviting us. So then we have to talk secondly then about turning down the invitation. 
Because in our text, now some time has passed. As it is with any invitation, somebody invites you to a dinner or a wedding um, uh, where there's usually, you know, some time in between you receiving the invitation and the actual event itself. And so in our text, that's what take that, that's what's taking place. The servant is sent out and he tells the people it's time now. Verse 17, come for all things are now ready. You know the story, verse 18, but they all with one accord begin to make excuses. Every single one of them said no. I have to ask the question, why would they make excuses when they've already accepted the invitation? I thought they wanted to go. I thought they were overcome with joy. I thought they were already rearranging their entire lives. Where's the gratitude they once had? Where's the sense of privilege that they once felt? What changed? Where all of a sudden now, it's excuses. From the time we accept his invitation and give our lives to Jesus, to the time where he actually calls us to do something for him. If we're not careful, our blessings can crowd out our sense of privilege and gratitude that we once had when we received the invitation. If we're not careful, now we're no longer interested in making good on that invitation. When the king invites you somewhere, it's hard to think of a situation you would not accept. Again, verse 18, but they all with one accord begin to make excuses. That one accord, what it is saying is their excuses were different, but truthfully, all excuses are the same. They're just an attempt to justify and defend. Someone said excuses are lies wrapped up in reasons. Spurgeon said excuses are curses, and when you have no excuses left, then there will be hope for you. Interesting, the wording in our text. The first two politely asked to be excused. But I believe the third actually verbalizes uh, uh, what they all had said. Verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. I want you to catch this uh, because it, it, it's not just that they said no, but they said I can't. I'm unable. You know, I would if I could. But I just, let, let, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I actually would love to come. But unfortunately, it's just not possible, man. But see, how many know the whole point Jesus is trying to make in telling this parable is to bring to the surface the reality that they could have come if they really wanted to. Yeah. They were simply choosing not to come, They made excuses because clearly something else had taken priority. But see, they're no different than us. I mean, no, we don't want to tell the king outright no. (laughs) So what we do is we do what they did. We try to convince ourselves, I can't. Tell me, no, the Bible says all of our hearts are deceitful. And so when an opportunity is presented, we're like, you know what, Pastor? I would if I could. Oh, I'd love to. You know what? You need somebody to go? Ah. Man, I'm telling you, man, if I could. <gasps> See, as blood bought believers, we understand we can't just say no to God. That'd be blatant disobedience. That's not an option. So instead, what we do is we tell ourselves things we can live with. Pastor Campbell has called it years, accommodating theology. You have to tell yourself because you have to live with yourself. And so if we can rationalize it out in our mind, then we walk away, we feel fine. Can you imagine 18-year-old Daniela Tipperly turning down the invitation to the royal wedding? I mean, no, that would have made bigger news than her getting the invitation. <laughs> Well, that'd be the same as you and I saying no to Jesus. 
In our text, you know the story. They each gave different, different reasons. I bought a piece of land. I must go see it. I bought a yoke of oxen. I have to go test them. Married a wife. A couple things right here I want you to think about. Who first buys a piece of land and then goes to check it? <laughs> Who buys 10 yoke of oxen before they ever tested them? That'd be like buying a used car and never even wear up. Uh, I don't need a test drive. That doesn't even make any sense. But see, that's the thing with excuses. Our own sounds so good to us, but so foolish to everyone else. Like, that don't make any sense. Can you imagine the servant like, okay, I'll tell him what you said, but he ain't, he ain't gonna buy that. Reminds me of the story of the teacher who received an email from the student that said, sorry, I didn't do my homework. I didn't have the internet. <laughs> email? In our text, it is impossible to ignore that two out of three excuses, listen to me, had to do with what they bought. Purchases. Money speaks to what they had invested in. Let me ask you this morning. What have you purchased that if God would tell you this week, the time is now, I'm ready now. You would have to tell him, I I'm sorry, Lord, I can't. Let me show you what I bought. Let me show you what I've invested in. Let me show you my new building. Let me show you my successful church. I paid a price for this. I have to see it. I have to look after it. If I respond now, they say I won't get my full 401k. Someone said prosperity has weakened more men than poverty. Most men can pass the test of poverty or even persecution, as our brother mentioned, but they have difficulty passing the test of prosperity. Think of David. The adversity and vulnerability of caves drew the best out of him. But it was the luxury of the palace that exposed the worst in him. We've all heard of the lottery curse. People who win the lottery and they think, man, this is so wonderful. But then it becomes a curse. There's a man by the name of Andrew Whitaker. In 2002, he won the largest uh, jackpot ever awarded to a single Powerball winner at that time, $314 million. He said that between people asking him for money, people breaking in his car and his home, stealing his money. He said he started a company and uh, eventually that company was hit with all sorts of lawsuits, uh, legal fees and all of these things. Uh, his wife, who he had been married to for well over 30 years, she ended up divorcing him. He had a granddaughter. He gave her lots of money, bought her cars, but that began to attract the wrong crowd to her. And so uh, her boyfriend, long story short, OD'd, uh, he uh, and got hooked on drugs uh, because of the money. He ended up killing Whitaker's granddaughter. Eventually, Whitaker said, I lost all the people I loved and all the money I had. He said, and I have to thank this lucky lottery ticket. Wow. said, I wish I had torn it up. You know, something very fascinating. You have these countries with all types of persecution, and Christians thrive there. But in America, with all our prosperity, Christians die here. Wow. And when I speak of prosperity, I'm not just talking about money. Your ministry could be prospering. Your church could be experiencing prosperity. And yet the king could st still say, now I'm ready for you. I have something else for you. So what exactly has changed from the time of receiving the invitation to now? One word, blessing. We know it's a blessing to be able to buy some land. It's a blessing to have a good job. We know Proverbs tells us that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. And so it is a blessing to be married. But see, all that has changed now is time and blessing. Now, these men are using 
their blessing as an excuse for turning down the invitation. Again, this can be you and I. And the deception is it sounds so reasonable. I mean, it's a wife. It's a job. It's an opportunity. But here's my question. Here's the bigger question. Where did those blessings come from? These things come from God. Deuteronomy 8.18, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Where does a wife come from? Proverbs 18.22, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor, not because of you, from the Lord. How many times do people stand up, I want to thank God for my wife. I want to thank God for my husband. If it wasn't for God. So here's my point. These things came from God. And now the things that you've said God has blessed you with. If you're not careful, these become the very things that are causing you to say no to God. The blessing has now become a curse. See, when God wants to use your life. When God says, okay, it's time. I, I want to use you. I want you to go somewhere. Sorry, Lord, but you know that land you blessed me with? Ah, Got to go see it. That job you gave me? Oh, I need another year before I can leave it. The wife you blessed me with? She thinks the kids are going to have to suffer. She doesn't want to leave her house and, you know, our, our health care. Are you allowing the blessing? to hinder an obedient response. This is the wife. Can I ask you, wives? Are you the blessing that's become a curse? Interesting. People get married, then forget where they met. They forget how they met. You know what actually stirred this sermon? I was speaking with a pastor, and he's telling me about this couple in his church, and He's just kind of talking to them. He's like, hey, man, I, I never see you guys at outreach anymore. You know, just one of those conversations. What's going on? And, and the guy's making this. He said, wait, 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 wait. Didn't you meet your wife on an impact team? And now you can't go to impact teams or outreach? The very thing that bless you has become a curse. Could be our children. People whose kids stop them from coming to church. Wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say children are a blessing from the Lord? People no longer call because they have children. Romans 125, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And worship and serve the creation rather than the creator. You can absolutely misuse the blessing. Let's close and talk about remembering where we came from. Here's the key that I think we have to understand, and that is whatever God blesses you with, he must be able to ask for it back. Otherwise, it is not a blessing. It's a curse. If the blessing prevents you from responding to God's invitation, then you've turned it into a curse. Remember, I had a, Job at Oxford International is a company here in Chandler. I had no business getting this job. It's an engineering company. <laughs> if you know engineering, engineering is a totally different language. And I remember going to the interview, and I, I had been out of work for three months. I, I got saved. I quit the job at Gold's Gym because it's a perverted place. And, you know, you do these things in new conference. You're like, wait, but I don't have a job. <laughs> so here you go. You're like, okay, you got all the faith, and one month turns into two months. My three months, you're like, you think about calling goals. No, no. <laughs> so, so I'm there. I go to this interview. I get, a, I get a call from a guy named Kevin Kowalski, Oxford International. I go to interview, and I promise you, Kevin Kowalski uh, was a, um, a Boston Celtics fan. And he was from Massachusetts. He was the manager. And all we talked about was basketball. <laughs> I didn't know engineering, but I knew basketball. <laughs> and by the time we were finished, he's like, can you start on Monday? Yeah. <laughs> I started that job on Monday. 
It was the best job I ever had. I made more money than I could have ever imagined making. But God told me, remember, because when me and my wife got saved, we, we had over $30,000 in debt from most of it university, college debt. But God, God said, listen, I want you to get out of debt so you can do my will. And so we were able to get out of debt. We were able to buy a house. We're doing things. And then Pastor Campbell, we're getting ready to send. I says, hey, why don't you come on staff and, and lead the follow-up team? Okay. Now, Pastor, I love you, but what he was going to pay us <laughs> and what Oxford was paying us? <laughs> and so, you know, you're not really wrestling, but you're like, how are we going to do this? But God said, remember why I gave you the job. Can I have it back? See, the blessing remained a blessing because it got us out of debt. And we were able to do God's will. Listen to me. God blesses you so that you can do his will, not the other way around. Amen. Amen. Think about Hannah. She said, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Abraham. We know God blessed Abraham not for himself, but he said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. To my people, to the kingdom. See, Abraham is powerful. Think He's waited on this promised son forever. Years and years and years. I'm waiting. Then he gets the promised son, and God says, I want him back. I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham, in obedience, says, God, you gave him. He belongs to you. If he can sacrifice a son, what is a car? A house? 401k, a retirement, a job. It's a reason he's the father of the faith. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, your lives, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And we know how this finishes, which is only reasonable. Say you've been bought with a price. Listen, every day in the kingdom, I believe, one of the things I tell myself when I wake up in the morning, it's it's time to re-enlist. You have to re-enlist every day. Pastor Meyer told me years ago, he says, I tell God, I tell God, listen, today is a new sacrifice. Yesterday's offering was yesterday's offering, but today has to be a fresh offering. What are we saying, Pastor? we're, We're not just talking about the churches you launched before. That doesn't exonerate us from the will of God and the Great Commission. What about this week? What about today? Are you going to use the blessing? Oh, I got disciples. I hear people, man, God's moved. We got disciples. Does you, do you have disciples or does God have disciples? Because if you don't send them, I don't know if they're his. Danger and prosperity. You know, you know the reason I'm preaching this, if I can be honest with you, it's because God is blessing our fellowship so much that it's scaring me. Yeah. It's scaring me. I listen to the stories of the first generation and what they didn't have and sitting on the floor and no buildings. and no, But I look at their faith. And then I look at our generation sometimes and they're like, but I first got to do this. I got to get my house. I need this. I need that. And ah, I'm like, God is the blessing. The danger in prosperity is that it has the ability to kill and weaken faith. John D. Rockefeller, he was a very interesting character. I'll share this with you and I'll close He was, and actually, by the way, remains the richest man who ever lived. Richer than Bill Gates, richer than Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, John D. Rockefeller. But John D. Rockefeller was born extremely poor. 
When he was 16 years old, he was making like 50 cents a day as a bookkeeper. His father was a conniving con man, but his mother was a devout Christian. Very interesting parents. And Rockefeller was born during the Second Reform Reformation back in 1844 when the enlightenment of Christians was happening. And his mother taught him real finances and real thrift. And so he began to start various businesses. And pretty soon he was running, you know, this, this refining oil. And uh, everything uh, was going into oil at that time. Um, he became the owner of the Standard Oil Company. Um, by the time Rockefeller was 43, he was the richest man in the world. At 53... He was making a million dollars a week. That's back then. But he was shriveled up. He was unhappy. He was worried that everyone was trying to take everything that he had. He was trying to hoard everything and keep a monopoly on everything. They say he was actually a pretty ruthless businessman. Couldn't sleep at night. Some of his workers striked. There was a riot. People were shot. He had to have security watching him all the time um, because people wanted to murder him. He developed alopecia from all the worry and lost his hair. He used to have, they say, this, um, you know, handlebar type mustache. But through all this, they say he becomes shrunken and he, they say he looked like a mummy. Some say the Lord had reduced him to nothing. Couldn't eat. Richest man in the world, think of this. They say he could only eat milk and crackers because of the stress and the ulcers. Doctors figured he had about a year left to live. They say the newspapers were rejoicing. They wrote his obituary early so they would be ready in advance. During this time, a friend who was a pastor, you know, Rockefeller went to church every week because of his mother's influence. A pastor talked to him. He said, John, your wealth, your wealth is like an avalanche that is crushing you. You need to start giving it away. You can't take it with you, man. It's destroying you. Rockefeller knew it was true because he had spent nights realizing that at any moment it could all be gone. And what good was it? He said that night he went and prayed. He came to terms with the fact that everything he had accumulated, listen to this had come from God. He recalled how poor he had started out. So from that night on, he made a deal with God. He vowed to spend the rest of his life giving it all away. He established the Rockefeller Foundation, which developed penicillin and other things that saved many, many lives. And remember, back at age 54, doctors had given him a year to live. But after this encounter, he really became a different man. Started to sleep. Those who knew him said he would smile more than he had ever smiled before. Rockefeller lived to be 97 years old. Here's a man who grew up poor and God richly blessed. But it's like he had forgotten where those blessings had come from. Along the way, he gets his heart right with Jesus, starts using the blessing for its intended purpose. Not only did it save and heal his own life, but it saved and healed countless others. What I'm saying this morning is the blessing that had become a curse became a blessing again. That is our hope here this morning. That is our hope in this conversation. It's not, hey, maybe we can't, man, I'm misusing, man, I'm letting this thing... But you can hear a word from God and say, man, I got to rearrange. I got to remember where I came from. I got to remember what I actually was doing and where I, what I had when God found me. And as God has poured out his blessing on me, oh, let me be a person that says, God, anything. If you want it, it's yours anyway. And I don't want it to curse my life when the blessing becomes a curse. That's all I have. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Let's all stand this morning. Wow. Powerful, powerful preaching already this morning. It's only a second.
sermon, well, three from last night, man. But uh, remember, uh, uh, no food or drink in the sanctuary. Keep that in mind. Remember, uh, if you go out the back door, go around. Uh, don't try to come back through that door for security reasons. So, hallelujah. Glory to God. Be back. Let's try to start working back 10 minutes before. Amen. We don't want to miss the start of Pastor Mitchell's message. Amen. I tell you, you don't want to miss what he has to say. He's excellent, excellent preacher. So, amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you, God, for this time of fellowship. I pray your blessing.